Welcome to Canada Forum. I'm the host, Bill Greiner, and I'm joined in studio today by United States Senator Jean Shaheen. Welcome, Senator. Nice to be here. So you're in the middle of a re-election campaign at this point in time against 14 former... 14 days and a wake up. Here we are. Yeah, former Senator Scott Brown from Massachusetts. Um, tell us a little bit about uh, so, you know, some of the issues. I know when you see ads uh, on TV, uh, both ways. Sometimes it, it doesn't really talk to the issues. Uh, and specifically, I want to talk about, you know, one of the issues, outsourcing. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about outsourcing at Scott Brown. Give me your perspective on that, and why is that an important issue in this election? Well, I think on a number of issues that are important to New Hampshire, there are big differences between my opponent, Scott Brown, and me. And outsourcing is one of those. You know, he voted to reward companies to ship jobs overseas. I don't think we should do that. I think it's important for us to encourage companies to come back to the United States, um, particularly some of those manufacturing companies that are providing good jobs to people. We want them back here. Um, and New Hampshire's had a strong manufacturing base in our economy. So I think if we can encourage companies to come home and stop rewarding them to ship jobs overseas, it would be good for New Hampshire. You know, what we saw with my opponent in addition to his vote is that he's now on the board of a company called Cadent that has as part of its business model shipping jobs overseas. And again, um, I think that's, that's the wrong direction. They want to ship jobs to China and Mexico. And for us here in New Hampshire, we've lost a higher percentage of jobs to China than any other state in the country. So this is very personal for our workers. And you know, I, I want to support small businesses to create good jobs because they're the foundation of our economy. And you know that, you know, companies like yours that are creating jobs and um, moving to new sites and, and really supporting the local economy. And that's good for us, not just because of those small businesses, but because two-thirds of jobs that are being created are coming from small businesses. So we, we need to look at how we can support small businesses as they're trying to create jobs. Senator, one of the issues that has been tossed around over the last couple of weeks has been uh, the, the abortion issue. Scott Brown is running as a pro-choice uh, Republican. Um, do you, do you view him as pro-choice, or is that some spinning that's kind of going on in the media? Well, you know, with all these issues, I think it's important for voters to look not just at what we say, but to look at our voting record. And this is a place where he and I have a difference, because I trust women to make their own decisions about their reproductive health, not just part of the time, but all of the time. And if you look at my opponent's record, when he was in Massachusetts, when he ran in both 2010 and 2012, he was endorsed by Massachusetts anti-choice groups. They said in 2012 that he voted with them 80% of the time. When he was in the Senate, he sponsored something called the Blunt Amendment that would say any employer can deny their employees access to contraceptives for any moral objection. Now, I, I appreciate the religious concerns of the church and other organizations, but that's already been dealt with in terms of the Affordable Care Act. So they have a bypass that addresses that concern. Um, then when the Supreme Court came out with their Hobby Lobby decision this summer that said, in fact, some employers can deny access to their employees for contraceptives. Um, my opponent supported that as well. So I, I have my entire um, public life stood up for women to make their own decisions about these very personal and private concerns. I think women should be able to do that with their families, with their medical provider. And I think women want a senator they can trust, not just part of the time in Washington, but all of the time. Uh, you mentioned women. Women are an important voting block, as you very well know, in this state. They pay attention and they vote. Um, how, what other women's issues are there out there that you think there's a difference between you and, and your opponent? And um, you know, could you highlight those for us? You know, when I, way back in the early 80s, I got appointed by former Governor Hugh Gallon to the Commission on the Status of Women here in New Hampshire. And one of the things that I did as part of that was to chair a report on women's employment in the state. And the commission held hearings all over New Hampshire. And I wrote the report along with some other members of the commission. And at that time, women were making about 59 cents for every dollar a man earns. 
so we didn't have equal pay for equal work. Now we're up to 78 cents. Um, but the conclusion of that report and looking at all of the employment challenges for women was that when women aren't getting um, paid what they're worth, when they're being discriminated against in the workplace, it's not just women who are hurt by that, it's their families and it's the entire economy. So a woman now who works 40 years over her lifetime, she's going to lose over $450,000 because of the disparity in what women are getting paid compared to men um, for doing the same job. So uh, I was proud when I first got to the Senate, one of the first bills I voted for was the Lilly Ledbetter Law which addressed equal pay for equal work to some extent. Um, but it didn't do enough to really um, go after that differences that women experience. And so I'm a co-sponsor of something called the Fair Pay Act. Scott Brown, when he represented Massachusetts in the Senate, voted twice against the Fair Pay Act. So he says he supports equal pay for equal work, but, but you can't just look at what people say, you have to look at what he's done. And I think there's a real difference there between the two of us. You know, on minimum wage, um, two thirds of our minimum wage workers here in New Hampshire are women. And yet Scott Brown doesn't believe we should raise the minimum wage. I think, I think we should. I think we need to look at making sure that people can, um, can support their families when, when they're minimum wage workers. Over the last year, Senator, you've talked ab about some of the basic economic uh, issues that families are facing, wages you know, being one of them, child care costs being another one. Um, are you finding that to resonate with folks on the campaign trail all, all throughout New Hampshire? For sure. You know, we, we've seen, I think now, about 55 months of private sector job growth. We've seen, although in the last week the stock market has been a little volatile, but we've seen the stock market recover since the financial meltdown of um, 2008. Um, we've seen some other indicators that are moving in the right direction. Unemployment is down. But one of the, one of the real challenges that I think so many families are still facing is that they haven't seen their wages improve with, with the other improvements in the economy. And so I think we've got to look at, at how we can support middle class families. They've been the foundation of this country. You know, I was, um, I'm, I'm older than you, but I had the benefit of growing up in post-World War II America where um, we were seeing a real boost to the middle class as the result of things like the GI benefits and um, support for education. And so I think we've got to look at ways in which we can continue to support families, um, too many of whom are still struggling. So what I've, I have been interested to find out is that for families with children who have children in child care, that that's their second biggest expense after their mortgage or whatever, their rent. Um, to keep a, an infant in child care full time in New Hampshire is about eleven to twelve thousand dollars a year, and we haven't raised the child and dependent care tax credit since Jimmy Carter was president. Only once have we raised it. So this is a place where we haven't kept up with support for families. A another place that's a huge issue that I hear from people all over New Hampshire is the concern about how are their children going to pay off their student loans. And that's an, a big issue for us here in New Hampshire. We have the second highest student loan debt in the country. It's about $33,000 per student. And for a lot of young people, it's affecting all of the decisions after they graduate about what they're going to do with their lives. I was meeting with realtors earlier this summer. And one of the things the realtor said was they're, they're seeing this in first time home buyers that they're seeing first-time home buyers delaying buying that home because of their student loans. So this is, this is an issue that we've really got to address. I had, um, several years ago, I went to visit a young man from New Hampshire who was at Walter Reed Hospital who had lost a leg in Afghanistan to an IED. And I remember going to see him and his wife and his new baby were there. And he didn't talk about his recovery and the challenges to recovering after losing that leg. What he talked about was the fact that he had student, he and his wife both had student loans and he wasn't sure how he was gonna be able to pay those off. 
So that just shouldn't happen in this country. We need to make sure that our young people can can get a higher education without mortgaging their futures to do that. It's not just good for them, but it's good good for us. It's good for the our workforce. We need a, a skilled workforce that has the education that's required. I mean, I'm sure you see that with your employees. And so well, we need to figure this out. One, one thing I think everybody would agree on is there's a huge difference between New Hampshire and Massachusetts, com border states, uh, but completely different. Uh, your opponent has recently moved here from Massachusetts, and you've lived here you know, for a long time, served in, uh, in uh, the U.S. Senate for the last six years and governor before that, and certainly lived here even prior to you know, becoming uh, in the state Senate. Um, how big of an impact is that, do you think, uh, on New Hampshire? You know, is you, someone like you who lives here and, and connects with people versus someone that moves here, is, is, is your opponent one who can connect with, with folks having just moved here, and, and how, how much of a disadvantage you, do you see that being? Well, you know, I, th I think it's not so much about where we're from, but it's more about um, what we've done and who we work for. And when I've gone to, when I was governor, when I, in the last six years in the Senate in Washington, uh, I've worked for the people of the state, trying to make a difference for my constituents, for the small businesses that are here, trying to support our small businesses because they're the foundation of our economy. Um, that's how you and I first met, was um, working on some of those issues. And supporting middle class families with things like helping young people refinance those student loans um, so that they don't mortgage their future to pay for their education. And what we saw from my opponent when he represented Massachusetts in the Senate is that he supported um, the big corporations. He, he consistently supported subsidies to the oil companies. Now, you know, the five biggest oil companies in America made over $90 billion last year. I don't think they need the billions in subsidies. We need to be supporting our small businesses. Um, we've got a lot of businesses in New Hampshire that are involved in new energy technologies that are doing really exciting things. And um, I think we need to take some of those subsidy monies, which I don't support, and use them to try and encourage these new energy technologies. I supported something called the Small Business Jobs Act, which um, helps companies with exporting. Um, we've got about 95% of markets that are outside of the United States, but only 1% of our small businesses are exporting outside of the United States. The legislation helped with access to credit, with um, tax breaks, and I worked really hard on that legislation. I thought it was important to New Hampshire. Scott, I voted for it. Scott Brown voted against it. Um, we had legislation called the American Jobs Act, which would have cut the payroll taxes for 30,000 businesses here in New Hampshire. I'm sure that you all could have benefited from a cut in the payroll taxes. Um, would have created almost 2,000 jobs. I voted for it. My opponent voted against it. Um, we have something called the Travel Promotion Act, which I sponsored to encourage advertising outside of this country to bring visitors to America. One of the lessons for me when I was governor that I got from the travel industry was that visitors who come from outside of the country stay longer and they spend more money. And since tourism is our second biggest industry, that's helpful. I mean, you see that, I'm sure, and people coming to visit here. I voted for that legislation. My opponent voted against it. So I think there are big differences between what he supports and what I've supported. And I think we need a senator who's going to support what's good for New Hampshire, support our small businesses, support our, our families, our working men and women. And just um, picking up on that theme for a minute, every year you host a New Hampshire Day Down. I think it's in June of every year. Yes, and, and we've been there. New Hampshire. Talk about that real, real briefly and, and what got you motivated to do, to do that in the first place, because I find it to be a, a pretty unique you know, experience and it tries to highlight some of the best that New Hampshire has yeah. to offer. Well, and I wish I could take credit for it. Actually, it wasn't me. It was somebody on my staff who came up with this idea. And I, it's been great. Um, I think this was our fifth year, this past year. And we highlight New Hampshire businesses. We hi highlight um, our tourism industry, our great hospitality industry. And you all are an example of that, your businesses. And 
not only showcase them to policymakers on Capitol Hill. We have a big event in the evening, a big reception, and we invite um, all of the members of Congress. We invite a lot of um, people from agencies who are in a position to make a difference um, for in the economy and for people. And we have great examples of our food and um, a lot of our craft beers, some of our wines. Um, and the businesses that are here as well. So we've had um, Segway has come down and participated. First robotics competition, which is um, started by Dean Kamen right here in Bedford, is always featured there. Um, the Institute of Politics at St. A's. And not only is it an opportunity for people to come and see what New Hampshire is like, but we started New Hampshire Business Day as part of that. And we bring down all of the business people who are part of um, the displays at the reception in the evening. And we invite them to come to a, a several hour session in the afternoon where we invite um, people who are part of the government to come in and talk to them. So we've had everyone from John McCain. This year we had the Secretary of Commerce, um, Penny Pritzker. We had um, Secretary of State John Kerry. We, I think we had four cabinet officials. The head of the Small Business Administration was there this year. And it's a great opportunity for our business people in New Hampshire to not only hear from people in Washington, but also to be able to ask them questions, to find out um, what's going on, and to see if, if they can get answers to what they would like to know. And, and for people in Washington to hear from us here about what we're concerned about. So it's been a huge success, and uh, I'm, I think for everybody who's been involved, for all of our staff people, for all of the businesses and the products that are represented that come down every year, um, I'm really proud of, of the opportunity to showcase New Hampshire. Now this race is, is interesting in terms of the amount of money that's, that's come into it. Uh, you see TV ads all the time, obviously radio ads, print ads. How, how is the massive amount of money that's come into your race uh, affected the race? I think there's way too much money being spent on campaigns. This race is a great example of that. Um, there's too much third party money coming in from people outside of the state and people here have no idea who these people are um, and what they represent, what they want to accomplish. And you know when Scott Brown first got into the race the first thing I did was challenge him to take something that he called the People's Pledge. He came up with this idea in 2012 or 2011 when he was running against Elizabeth Warren. And what we saw with the People's Pledge, it was an effort to shut down that third party money coming in from out of state. And it really worked in that 2012 campaign. Um, he and Elizabeth Warren both agreed to it. It um, essentially shut down money coming in from third parties and it reduced the number of negative ads by about 50 percent and you know he said it was good for the voters of Massachusetts I was disappointed that he thought it was good enough for the voters of Massachusetts but not good for the voters of New Hampshire and so we've seen millions and millions of dollars in outside money coming in here I think we need campaign finance reform I think it doesn't make sense either that corporations can come in and spend unlimited amounts of money or that um, millionaires and billionaires can come in and spend unlimited amounts of money when citizens here in New Hampshire are limited in what they can spend and even if they weren't most people don't have the money to spend the kind of money that these outside groups are spending and you know when Scott Brown refused to take that his own people's pledge. What he said was it was because there had already been money spent in this race. But there had already been money spent in the race in Massachusetts when they agreed to it. So I think that was a red herring. I think it would have been good for New Hampshire. And I can't tell you how many people I talk to who say, oh, I can't wait for the election to be over so all of the ads will stop. And I understand that. New Hampshire, as you know, is a very unique state. We've got the first in the nation primary, which is just a great thing for New Hampshire and great and great if you're here. Um, we're two years away from the next presidential election. It seems like it's a long way off, but it re really isn't, as you know. There have been a lot of candidates that have made their way to New Hampshire. Already. Already, two years ahead of time. How has that af affected your ra race? Um, 
and you know what kind of impacts do you see you know over the next couple of weeks as the race you know comes to an end you know i think candidates are both on both sides have been here um campaigning endorsing um and I think generally that's good for New Hampshire because I think the more people we have who are thinking about running for president, who might be in a position to make decisions, who are here paying attention to the, the race and to the state is a good thing. You know, I, I think one of the things that I love about New Hampshire is our presidential primary. And I think it's important not just because it's a chance for us to hear from all these people running for president, but it's also important for the presidential process. I think it's really important for people to, candidates running to come into a small state like this, to have um, sessions in living rooms, to, to talk to voters, and to have to answer questions from voters. Um, switching gears, bipartisanship is, is a uh, phrase that comes up uh, more and more. I think there's been a little bit of frustration sometimes with uh, you know how Washington has functioned, and as you and I've talked about, you know the, the media portrays one part of it, and there's a lot of stuff that goes on behind mm -hmm. the scenes that people don't see that is bipartisan. You've worked you know with your colleague Senator Ayotte, who's a Republican, on several different things that have benefited New Hampshire. Can you talk about you know some of those bipartisan uh, efforts and and how it's impacted our state? Yes, and I think it's been important for us as a small state to have senators who work together, and Senator Ayotte and I do that. You know, one of the one of the really nice things in Washington about the women in the Senate is that we meet about every other month. We have dinner together, Republicans and Democrats, and we have a very good working relationship. And I think that's true of Senator Ayotte and me as well. We serve on the Armed Services Committee together. We're the only state that has both senators on the Armed Services Committee. And so we have a chance to work on issues at the shipyard, at peas um, that affect our National Guard in a way that is really important to the state. And you know, one of the things I'm very proud of, as I said, is that um, she and I worked together to get an amendment into the veterans reform legislation that would address the ability of our veterans to get health care close to home. Um, we're the, one of the only states in the country that has, does not have a full service veterans hospital. And that means that our veterans have had to travel long distances to Massachusetts, to Vermont, um, to get their care, and oftentimes have had to wait for long periods of time. And we worked together to get an amendment into the Veterans Reform Bill that would say that anybody who lives more than 20 miles away from a full-service veterans hospital in a state like ours that doesn't have one, is able to get care close to home from a, a provider, a private provider, as long as they're Medicare certified. So this is a real game changer for the veterans of New Hampshire and something that I think we're both very proud of. Now, Senator, do you think there's a, a, a chance at some point that we would have a full service VA hospital? I'm, again, I'm not sure what that process is, but as you mentioned, we're one of the few states that doesn't have it. And as you know, we have a lot of veterans in this in this state. Well, we do. The first legislation I introduced when I got to Washington was for a full service veterans hospital or equivalent care. And I think the provision that we got into this bill addresses the equivalent care piece of that. So it says that veterans, veterans can get care from their private provider. And for a lot of veterans, that's hopefully that's going to be even better because it means they're not going to have to travel the long distances so that veterans up in the North Country won't have to come all the way down to Manchester or go someplace else in the state or go to White River Junction or go to Massachusetts. And you know, we've also, I've also worked hard. Um, we were able to get a new veterans clinic over in Keene, which has been a real boost to the western part of the state. We've got, Senator Ayotte and I have worked together to get new veterans centers coming to the North Country, to Berlin and Colebrook. And again, that will be a real benefit for those veterans who have had to travel so far. You know, one of the things that I got to do on Saturday was to go visit the traveling Vietnam War Memorial, the traveling wall down in Salem. And it was such a moving experience to talk to veterans who had served in Vietnam, many of whom were there looking for lost um, lost friends who they had served with. And when we think about those sacrifices that veterans have made for this country, 
it's really important that we make sure that when they need health care that they can get it in a way that doesn't require that they travel long distances that they wait for many hours um, so hopefully this will help address that and the last question for you uh, there's a lot of um, stuff that's facing the US right now both domestically and internationally uh, what are what's the, the biggest thing that you see and what in the first 90 to 180 days of next session would you what's the one thing that you would push or try to have introduced uh, in the Senate to to deal with one of the issues whether it's domestic or or international um, well I'm still working with Rob Portman Republican from Ohio on energy legislation because one of the the big challenges we still face particularly here in New England is um, making sure we have affordable energy it's something that affects everybody whether you're heating your home with number two heating oil or whether you're um, in a business um, it's it's an issue for all of us and we need we need an energy strategy in this country um, Rob Portman and I are working on an energy efficiency strategy and I'm hopeful that we can get get that bill passed and make sure that we can begin to address um, energy savings in this country because it's the cheapest fastest way to deal with our energy needs well great well senator thanks for taking the time and coming in today we appreciate it as always wish you the best of luck in the last couple of weeks of your campaign and hope to see you back here next year as a senator again well thank you i hope so i appreciate the opportunity to be here and and i hope everybody watching will decide they can support me on election day i i ask for their vote